You're listening to the Mid-Career GPS Podcast, episode 118. Many job seekers worry about specific interview questions. These questions can range from the dreaded, tell me about yourself question, to what are your strengths and weaknesses, to addressing any career pivot or gap that's on your resume. All this month, I'm helping you prepare for your next interview, and today, you'll meet Linda Lautenberg from Evolve Me. Linda is a return-to-work expert, women's career advancement strategist, and champion for all midlife career changers. She's the co-founder of Evolve Me, an organization that specializes in career reinvention and community building for women in midlife career transition. Along with her co-founder, she developed Evolve Me's proprietary DARE method of career reinvention to help cohorts of high-achieving women attain clarity, gain confidence, and launch the best chapter of their professional life. In today's episode, you'll learn how Linda navigated her personal and professional pivots that included moving for her husband's job and raising their three children and why you need to stop defending or apologizing for any career gap during your interview. I asked Linda to play with me as I asked her four rapid-fire questions to help you prepare for your next interview. You will not want to miss that. This is the Mid-Career GPS Podcast, and I'm your host, John Nerrill. I help mid-career professionals who feel stuck, undervalued, and underutilized show up to find a job they love or love the job they have using my proven four-step formula. It's time to start building your mid-career GPS, so let's get started. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the podcast. I recently wrapped up a six-part mini-episode series where each episode focused on a particular aspect for your interview preparation. But if you're looking for something more, I have two things for you. First, I'm launching a new group coaching program to help you with your next interview. Now, this one-month program combines elements of group coaching along with one-on-one coaching so you can get what you need to calm your nerves, be more confident, and be more effective at telling your story clearly and cleanly during your interview. My program launches this September, but you can get on the mailing list right now, and I'll send you updates and information as we get ready to begin. You can find all the information in the show notes or visit my website at johnnarrell.com forward slash group hyphen program for more information. And while you're there, check the webinar tab on my website for details about my upcoming free webinar, five crucial tips to help you build your interview preparation checklist. When I met Linda Lautenberg and Judy Schoenberg, there is no question, they are a dynamic duo. When we met, we considered doing one podcast episode where I interviewed both of them, but I quickly learned that their career stories and what they do is fascinating, that I wanted to showcase each of them separately. You can visit the show notes to listen to my conversation with Linda's co-founder at Evolve Me, Judy Schoenberg, where we talked about the fear of standing out. But for now, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Linda Lautenberg. My name is Linda Lautenberg, and I'm the co-founder of Evolve Me. We help uh, women that are in mid-career relaunch or make a career change. I am a huge fan of what you and your co-founder, Judy Schoenberg, do. As a side note, I had Judy on the podcast several months back. I'll make sure to link up that podcast episode in the show notes as well. But today's focus is all about you and your career journey. So as we get started, tell us what you wanted to be growing up. Honestly, it's going to sound so boring. When I was little, if somebody asked me, I said I wanted to be a lawyer. (laughs) <laughs> because and, uh because so like very quickly my father died when I was little and so I was raised by a single mom for a while until she got married and I guess I just um 
saw that that could happen, I guess, as a child. So in the back of my mind, I always thought I just needed to find a career that I knew I could support myself by myself. And I I don't know why I had that at such a young age, but it was just always fixated in my mind. And it actually affected, you know, my career journey at the very outset. Yeah, that's obviously a powerful moment and and a huge life lesson in -hmm. that regard. So where'd you go to school? Um, so I went to the University of Minnesota because I grew up in, in the Twin Cities. Um, and that was the the in-state tuition that I could work with. Um, and um, so I, and I was a marketing major and I thought that that's, you know, I had since like gotten rid of the lawyer idea and I was going to be a marketing uh, major. And um, yeah, but then I did not go into marketing. I think there's a lot of people listening who are going to resonate with that in-state tuition (laughs) comment, Mm -hmm. especially Mm -hmm. for those who are have either taken their kids to school yet or are planning to in the upcoming years. So walk us through for a minute. You you go through college. Yeah. What's what's life like for you right after you graduate? So While I was job interviewing, um, I had an internship at um, a reinsurance company and I, um, you know, I was interviewing at a lot of like um, consumer product companies because that's what's in the Midwest, like the Cargills and the, you know, national cash register, things like that. And I, I got an envelope from Prudential Insurance Company. I thought, oh, my goodness, they want me to sell insurance you know, that's because I work, I'm interning at this place and I threw it away. Mm. And then I don't know what made me, but something made me like later in the day, I was like, you know, I should probably just see what it is. And I pulled it out and it was the most phenomenal management training program. And it was all in New York and it wasn't insurance. It was finance. It was all project finance and wall street finance. And I, thought I might as well give it a go. I didn't, I hadn't taken much in the way of finance classes, um, but they were recruiting me. And uh, honestly, the attraction for me was that it was in New York and I had never been to New York, but I wanted to, you know, I wanted an adventure. I wanted something exciting. Well, it goes without saying New York is such a great city and there's (laughs) so many things to do. Um, where did your career take you after you pick up everything, move to New York and go through this training? So it's definitely, and, and we see this a lot, and I'm sure you do too with, with people that we work with. Sometimes that first career, and, and I'm very clear on why I made that leap, and I'm really so happy that I ended up in New York and so many good things came from it. But sometimes that first job you take you just kind of then you're locked into that field, right? So you take the next step and the next step and the next step. My This move was great for me because um, they had such a well-regarded management training program and they were willing to sponsor people for their MBAs. If you had worked for them for three years, you rotated through different areas of finance there and they encouraged you to get your Charter Financial Analyst Certificate, which is a grueling three-year process, if anybody knows what a CFA is. Um But at the end of those three years, if a business unit was willing to sponsor you, they would, and you got into a top 10 business school, they would essentially pay for your MBA, assuming that you would come back, which was huge for me because I had no money. That is huge. Absolutely. I mean, I, I came from like fairly, you know, you know. Not a modest kind of means, right? Shell out a hundred thousand dollars for an MBA. Um, yeah, so then I I just got to where I did my CFA. I applied to four top ten business schools. I got into all of them and ended up going to Harvard. Impressive, (laughs) without a doubt, right? Now you go to Harvard. Yeah. What happens after that? Um, so, I mean, it was, it was such a great experience. I have to say that sometimes I wish that I had done that MBA later in life. I just actually, someone that just joined, um, Evolve Me's program. It's so impressive because she just, and she's in her forties, 
early 40s. She just completed her Columbia MBA. So, so I was a little jealous because she has a perspective of why she was going for that. I have to be honest, I was checking a box because at Mm -hmm. that time I felt like I needed, well, two things were going on in my head. I needed that MBA to, um, you know, to just kind of make it to the next level in my career. I'm not sure if MBAs are quite as, you know, critical anymore, but at the time, like that's what I needed to make it to the next level. But somehow in the back of my head too, I thought, you know, cause I was in my early mid twenties. I was like, what if, you know, at some point I take a break and have children, I'm going to want something on my resume that says that, you know, that gives me that pedigree. And, and it's funny that I thought about that that early on, but I did. Yeah. Well, it goes without question that we know the art, that the professional landscape has changed. It has mm-hmm. evolved, to your point, in a lot yeah. of different ways and things. And when we look at different types of career professionals and we look at those that might be classified, say, as a career enhancer, it's where mm-hmm. we have seen people go for advanced degrees and MBAs and things of that nature much later in life. And in some cases, to your point, with some greater intentionality mm-hmm. about how they want to maneuver that. Yes. All that being said, life happens. Mm-hmm. And for you, there's a real pivotal moment in your personal life and career journey where you start raising your family. Mm-hmm. And then you have what I typically like to call that that mid-career moment. Mm -hmm. What was that aha moment for you where things basically shifted quite a bit for you in your career? Sure. So, so I went after graduation, I went back to Peru and then ultimately went to um, work on a trading floor doing um, commercial back um, mortgage securities, like big deals. I was working from nine in the morning till like two o'clock in the morning, like just round the clock. It was really exciting. Um, I just thought I was going to do that forever. I had gotten married and then, and then all of a sudden I got pregnant and my mindset at the time was, well, I will just have this baby and then I'll come back to work and, just do a couple less deals, but I'm going to make this happen. In fact, I got put on bed rest and took my computer and my analyst back to my apartment with, I was trying to close a couple deals. I had the laptop on my stomach. (laughs) Um, I mean, I just, it never in a million years, even though I say that was in the back of my mind when Mm -hmm. I went for my MBA, never in a million years did I think I would take a long career break ever. Like I just worked really hard to get where I was. Yes. Um, And then I had that baby and um, well, actually what happened was I, the Nomura's commercial mortgage back operation, I came back from maternity break and the day that I came back, they folded. There was just a number of things that were happening in the finance world, in Japan, in different things that I don't need to go into, but you know, it was just gone. So there was my career break. So I thought, well, the world is telling me something. So I took some time off. I but I think it was a little too 180 to zero. So after nine months, I went back and started working four days a week doing consulting in that area, but on a more nine to five level. Um, And then my husband and I and my daughter, who was two, moved to New Jersey. Um, And suddenly, if you can think now, this was, gosh, she's 24. So she was two. This is 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. There was barely internet, right? Right. And I had only lived in the city for like even business school. I was in Boston. Like I had only lived in cities. So now to put me in the suburbs and the Jersey, I, I had no idea even what to do with that. I didn't even know what a person would do there. I couldn't commute. So I took a break. Also, my husband is a physician and was working like, you know, round the clock and we like didn't have nanny funds or anything like that. So I took a break. I thought it would be short. I will tell you that that mindset shift to, 
you know, people talk about it a lot. I know Judy had it when she left her executive career at her nonprofit. It is really hard to let go of that identity. And so um, for, I would say at least the first five years, if you met me, I would introduce myself as what I used to do for a living. Sure. I, um, I, that's such a great point because all of, so much of our identity gets instantly tied to what we do. It's yeah. that conversation starter when we meet somebody and they're like, oh, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And right yeah. away, it leads with that job title or that company we work for and, and things. Can you let us in a little bit more about that mindset shift that happened? Because taking a career break, and in part because, as as I understand the story, it's it's you know you're raising your family, mm -hmm. you, you move in part because your husband, as a physician, accepts a job, yes, and that changes your life in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. How do you? How do you manage that mindset shift when you have been on the go constantly and very performance and results driven? Mm -hmm. And now, like you said, your life just takes, in a very grateful and loving way, a huge mm -hmm. 180. Yeah. So, so I would say... I had three children. So some of that was just consumed by babies. I think at first I was really, I was struggling. It, like you said, if somebody asked me what I did, I would talk about what I used to do. Um, but then I just kind of decided to embrace it because I could see I was just in this period. I was like, you know, I just decided that I was going to embrace it, enjoy it and be grateful for the fact that we could afford for me to stay home for a little bit. I would say that lasted for three or four years. And then I just needed to get going and doing things. So I took all that and you'll see this with a lot of moms that have professional backgrounds or they're on career break. I just took all that energy and started putting it into my community, you know, into, into my children's schools, into local nonprofits, into taking leadership positions that way. Um, really thinking that I was just looking to keep myself busy, to give back, to like be grateful. Um, but what I didn't realize was that I was in the background developing all kinds of amazing portable skills that would be useful later on in my career. Because I have to say, as I said before, I was never thinking, oh, what I really want to do is raise money for skyscrapers. Like there was not, that was not a purpose that I ever had. My purpose was I want to go live in New York. So I had never taken, and I think so many of us never, I think maybe kids are a little better about that now coming out of college. I've got kids in college, but I think so many of us don't take that time to really think about what it is that you want to be when you grow up, you kind of just fall into that first job. Um, so I started discovering that a little bit through volunteer work. Which is such an important component when you talk about portable skills, because so much of the work that you do with Evolve Me is you help mid-career women figure out what, how they tell their story around the career break or how they make that pivot for them in their career. What advice would you give to someone who's listening, who may find themselves in a similar type situation? Mm -hmm. They're looking to actively get back in the, in, in the quote unquote, traditional workforce in that mm -hmm. regard. How would you help them position themselves strategically? And what would be some of the things you would want them to say when they go for their interview? Sure. So I think the, before you even get to interview prep, like everything that we do at Evolve Me is all around working on all that. There's so much inner work that needs to happen before you can start looking for a job. And in terms of like dealing with if you have a career break or you're making a change or like I, I, I always tell this story about when I was at my business school reunion and I was, you know, we were all like it was I was with my section mates and the guys all seemed to be having a great time. And I was talking to other women in my section, even my roommate. Um, and to a woman, including myself, every woman there was defending or apologizing what where she was in her career. There was some 
like nobody was owning what their story was and what their career journey had been. So whether they had taken a break and were and and were raising kids um, and not, you know, not traditionally working, whether they had skipped having a family thus far and were working, whether they were working and had kids at home, everybody was apologizing. Like nobody could just own it. So one of the first things that you need to do before you can start this preparation is you need to get a hold of your career story and be positive about it. Know that every decision you made along the way was made for a reason. And then think about everything that you learned along the way. Like I said, a lot of those, your resiliency, your portable skills, they will all feed into your narrative. It's an absolutely fantastic point in that there needs to be a lot of prep work and and self-work. And, and that's where we as coaches come in and, and help mm-hmm. people go through that whole process. I want to go back to something you said about defending and apologizing. Mm-hmm. That is something that without question comes up a lot. I'm curious from your point of view, why, what have you seen or what do you believe are the reasons why people feel the need to defend or apologize when they're connecting or networking or interviewing or even just leading up to the work that they're doing? Why does that happen and how do you get them out of it? So I honestly think, I mean, in this situation, I think that people are worried about you know, what is going to be assumed about them because of, you know, what's on paper. Are you going to assume that I'm a bad mother because my children are in daycare and I'm working? Are you going to assume that I have no ambition or that, you know, I'm sitting on the couch eating cookies because my husband's working and I'm, you know, caring for elderly parents, caring for children, whoever, whatever it is that I'm doing instead Um, instead of just getting comfortable with your own narrative and understanding why it is that you're doing what you're doing. But I think that that has a lot to do with it. We know that there can be a lot of events that cause gaps on resumes. Mm -hmm. You've talked about some of them. You take a time off, you take some time off to raise your family. There could be a medical situation. It could be someone got let go or laid off from a job, there was a a downsize and they just decided to take some time. We know within the past year with the great resignation, and and by the way, there's some other really great names that are coming out about that whole period as well. I've heard heard the great great reevaluation, the great revolution. (laughs) So whatever this great thing that any of the listeners are, are kind of thinking about and calling it, but when you take that gap, what advice would you give for somebody listening to help them um, phrase, couch, or explain sure. that gap on their, the quote unquote gap on their resume mm-hmm. when they're talking with a recruiter or they're talking with someone in an interview? Sure. So I would say the first thing is you just, like I said, you need to own the reason for your break. I would, you would want to lean in and just talk about, you know, like, like it doesn't, you don't need to dwell on it. Right. So if you had, you know, a couple of years break because your parent was sick and you were caring for them and you took a break for that, you know, just say what it is, state it, and then move on. You know, um, you can also though, I mean, Think about before you're in the interview or in that networking conversation, think about what it was that you were doing during that break and what you took away from that. Because a lot of times during this break, people have been upskilling, people have been trying new things, learning new things, helping someone else in their business, um, doing volunteer work and picking up all kinds of skills that they would not have had if they had just stayed in their previous role. Um, The other thing is that um, having that break sometimes can make you much more focused on what it is that you're looking to do now. And so you're so much more ready and prepared and knowing that this role and this field is what you're looking to go into now because you've had some time to think about it. That's great advice. And I know that's going to help a lot of the, the listeners today. 
as you know, this whole entire month has been devoted to focusing on helping people interview prep. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if we can just spend a few minutes, if I just rapid fire some questions at you and we just get you the top of your head, what you think the best, the best answers or approaches are. Does that sound good? All right. Okay. All right. Um, Question one. What do you believe to be the biggest challenge that mid-career women are facing right now in the marketplace or in the interview? So I think a lot of women are very concerned about ageism, right? And so the best way to combat that is to show people that you are, you know, that you're Um, very growth oriented, that you're very current on skills, that you're up on things, that you are, you know, that you love to learn, that you are a lifelong learner. And, you know, that uh, that's one of the things that we really find is the strongest that you can show that highlight that in your about section on your LinkedIn on your resume and in the way that you talk about yourself. What advice would you give for someone who landed an interview through a referral? Mm -hmm. So I guess I, you want to go in and make sure that you have done your homework and know everything that you can about the company. I would use that referral to find, see if you know, like, um, or a lot of times you do know going in who it is that you'll be referring and interviewing with. So, you know, without being too stalkerish, you want to find out about them, (laughs) you know, go on LinkedIn, find out about, look for some of those commonalities. I mean, you know, look, if you know the person that's going to be interviewing you, and if you have, if you're coming in through referral, I would, I would talk a lot to the person that's referring you and learn everything you can about the company from an insider's perspective. And then obviously with any interview, you want to read everything you can about the company, not just on their website, know what their mission statement is, but you want to read about what's going on with them in the news. But then find out if you know who you're going to be interviewing with, learn everything you can about them on LinkedIn, look at posts that they've done, things like that, look for commonalities so that you just understand who it is that you're you're going to be talking to and then really understand what the job description is to see where your skills fall on. As a quick side note, as I'm listening to you, I recall I had interviewed for a job years ago and, and it was through a referral, but the woman I interviewed with had recently been interviewed on PBS. And I was able to find that interview online and I captured a couple of bullet points from that. And it just, it helped build so much rapport within the interview because you had taken the time mm-hmm. to really try to learn as much as you could about the person you were going to be interviewing with. And, and it also shows a lot of respect and appreciation for the person who referred you as yeah. being someone who is a strong and viable candidate. Oh yeah. I mean, those, those opportunities you definitely want to take care of that person that was good enough to refer you. So you want to go in there as, but you'd be surprised how many people don't do correct that research. A- a- absolutely. Um, the, the one thing I would also say, going back to the um, mid middle life um, mm-hmm. part of it is so many interviews now, even though technically we're done with COVID, um, you know, um, uh, you know, we're online a lot right now too. So the way you show up online, the way your background is set up, your lighting, your like the way you're dressed, all of that matters and can make you seem current or not. So make sure that that you've got all that in place and that you've drive rehearsed it online. And honestly, like put on what makes you feel good all the way down to your shoes, even if it's online. Because it makes a difference. It makes every bit of difference in the world and how confident you feel. 100% agree with that. What's your favorite tip to help someone calm their nerves during an interview? (laughs) Well, I drink coffee, which is not going to calm everybody else's (laughs) nerves. I can't get on without coffee. Um, You know, I might, I mean... What we always do before every Evolve Me session, and I think it makes a lot of sense before you come into an interview. And honestly, John, you even asked me before we started here, as you know, I would get grounded, 
some deep cleansing breaths, and then think about what your intention is, yeah. right? Like what, what is, what are you bringing to this conversation? What are you, what do you want to come out of this conversation? Um, Linda, I would be remiss if I did not ask you this question I have specifically about salary. Okay. When people go through an interview, they get to that final round, they get the offer, or even leading up to it, they are asked a qualifying question. What is your salary? What are your mm -hmm. salary expectations for the mm -hmm. job? What advice do you give or you have for us today about how to negotiate or answer that salary question to the best of someone's ability? Well, first of all, go into the conversation knowledgeable about this. Like, do your research. There are all kinds of things like last door and things that you can know, like what the expected range is. But if you're, if they ask you that question, like what your salary range is, I would honestly put it back on them and ask them what, you know, what do they typically, you know, what is the pay range for this, you know, for this position and put it back on them because we've had women that have come through that, you know, have very successfully, you know, they've landed new jobs and they were put actually, and they've reached back out to us. And they said, you know, I did put it back to the interviewer rather than selling myself short. And what they ended up offering me was so much more money than I would have valued myself at, you know, especially if you're making, if you're coming from a break or a pivot or off a layoff, your confidence sometimes is low. And a lot of times you're going to underprice yourself. So I would really try to avoid putting a ceiling on how much you're worth and, and put it back to them and, and ask them, what is the typical salary range? Good point. Okay. As we start wrapping up, I want to just go back to one thing that we had wanted to talk about, and that was for people who are making a career pivot. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about handling the career break, but for those professionals who are looking to make a career pivot, go into something else, what advice would you have for them today? So for people that are looking to make a career pivot, the most important thing is going to be to really craft your career story. So if, if you're making, like I made the, you know, if you're making a pivot from finance to marketing or whatever, you, you need to connect the dots for the person you're talking to. So in terms of your LinkedIn, your resume, and in your interview, you want to pull out from your experience what's relevant, emphasize the skills that match the job description. You know, put yourself in their shoes. If, if you're hiring for this position, what are they looking for? And then you can de-emphasize some of the things, even if they're things you're really proud of. Sometimes your ego has to go down a little bit. De-emphasize some of the things that aren't quite as relevant. And then really get a hold of your career story and, and un help them to understand why you are making this pivot and why you're right for this. And then as you kind of share that pivot pitch and that career story, Practice sharing that out with your network, with your friends in pretend interviews, because and listen to where people are tripping over your story and where they're not making that connection. And you can refine and refine until it like really because you have to believe in the story and it has to make sense for you. So practice on others. And then when you get into that interview, you can connect the dots and have it completely make sense for that interviewer. Practice as much as you can. Practice, practice, but listen when you're practicing and listen for when people are not quite understanding and then go back and like massage your story a little bit. That's such a good point too, because we can practice by ourselves. We can record into a camera, phone, whatever that is, but it's that understanding piece. How much are people making the connections the, the dots, if you will, with yeah. that. So that's such a great tip. And then, and then the other thing is when you're when you're thinking about making that pivot, don't don't get hung up on only looking at the skills that you have from other jobs, because it's all about. I hate the term. I, I hate is a strong word, but Judy and I really don't love the word soft skills. Mm -hmm. We like to think of them more as portable skills. So, like so many. 
so many of the skills that I use in my work with Judy today have nothing to do with anything that I did in my finance career. And they're all things that I picked up from being a mom, being a volunteer, leading an organization, all kinds of things that I had had nothing to do with my career. They're all things I picked up along the way. So look at all aspects of your life. And employers are so are, are much more focused on those portable skills nowadays than they ever were before. In fact, most people, new hires, if they don't work out, it's because those portable skills weren't in place and um, and weren't a match for the company. And companies are paying attention to that. Great point. As we wrap up, what advice would you have for someone to help them build their mid-career GPS? So don't go it by yourself. And that's, that's something that both Judy and I both experienced. I, I, I spun my wheels for once I decided that I wanted to return to the workforce after quite a long break. Um, I just, I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm a smart person. I should be able to figure this out. I should be able to figure out what it is I want to do. You know, don't, don't try to do it by yourself. Find a tribe, find a group, find a coach, find other people that are going through the same process so that you don't feel so isolated. So you get that support, you get that feedback. And it's, it's a two way street because not only as you're getting support, you're also giving support to others. So it's also an enormous confidence boost and it can help you get so much more clear on what it is you're looking to do. So don't try to do it by yourself. Thank you for that. Well, Linda, I have absolutely enjoyed our time together. And thank you so much for adding a tremendous amount of value to this discussion this month about interviewing. But I want to turn the mic over to you now because you and Judy at Evolve Me have some amazing things coming that I would love for you to share with the listeners about. So the mic's yours. Sure. So um, we are really excited this um, this October. We are going to be launching the seventh cohort of our Evolve Me Reinvention Collective. And the Reinvention Collective is um, it's our signature program. It's a 12-week virtual cohort-based program for women who are looking to either relaunch their career or return to the workforce or have had or, you know, been laid off or, or maybe have had... Um, you know, something has a life transition that's impacted their career. Um, so it's all online. We meet virtually once a week. Um, and you can find more about it at evolveme.work on our website. Um, and there's also, if you head to our website, evolveme.work, we have some really great um, tools, uh, free tools and resources for you to start thinking about your next chapter. And I'm going to add to that, make sure that everybody follows you on LinkedIn and also follows you on Instagram. You put some interesting things out there as well for people. So it's another great place for them to connect. Yes, we're really, really active on both. And and so and follow you too, John, and listen to your podcast. Judy and I listen to your podcast all the time. Well, I'm honored. Thank you so much. I will make sure all of that is in the show notes for everyone. And I can't thank you enough. I know we have we have spent a, a little bit of time trying to get this interview together, but this absolutely was the right time for us to have this discussion. Linda Lautenberg, thank you for being such a wonderful guest on the Mid-Career GPS podcast. Thank you, John. It's been such a pleasure. All right, everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. If you happen to miss my special six-part mini episode series on interview prep, the nice thing is they're just the six episodes right before my conversation with Linda. You can go back and check that out. Visit johnnarrell.com for any additional information. And remember, we build our mid-career GPS one mile or one step at a time, and how we show up matters. Make it a great rest of your day.